So, um, yeah, thanks for the great introduction and the opportunity to present today. Um, I, today I'm going to talk about some uh, research work that we've done uh, looking for um, pathogens and trying to characterize um, uh, microorganisms in livestock production. Again, I'm an assistant professor, I'm sorry, an associate professor at the University of Iowa, and my expertise is industrial hygiene. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit of background. So, um, you know, when we think about microorganisms in the environment, uh, you know, a particular topic that's kind of a hot topic right now is, you know, viruses in the environment. So, um, they're a common cause of infectious disease um, indoors, and one of the least understood uh, an example of this is the respiratory illness called influenza, which is caused by the influenza virus, and it results in annual epidemics uh, with three to five million cases of severe illness and anywhere between a quarter and a half a million deaths world, worldwide. <clears throat> so influenza virus, it's an RNA virus with three subtypes, A, B, and C, and a is, the subtype A is believed to cause most epidemics. And uh, the influenza A virus can be further broken down based on into subtypes based on proteins. And surface proteins, they're uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, so the H1N1s, the H3 and 2s. And this is a public health concern for us. You know, we have um, historically we've had an example of the of a pandemic, the Spanish flu pandemic from 1918. You know, and and one of the hypotheses is that this um, Spanish flu was a result of a combination of, of uh, bird flu and swine flu, um, and perhaps originated in the Midwest. So it's, um, it's a real concern and, and of course, um, uh, resulted from zoonotic transmission um, from animals to people. Uh, you can see this uh, Venn diagram we have on the right side of the slide. I like it because it kind of displays graphically um, the overlap of, of influenza virus that uh, uh, can infect, you know, birds, humans, people, you know, H5N1, H7N9, those are really good examples of, uh, and it, you know, obviously it's a concern because more virus movement uh, results in exchange of genetic material and uh, the creation of new viruses, which can cause be a public health problem. So another public health problem that we're talking about a lot right now is, of course, the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, that results in uh, coronavirus disease or COVID-19, which is also a contagious respiratory illness. And the current pandemic, this is uh, as of yesterday, yesterday, the day before yesterday, I pulled these numbers off the World Health Organization uh, website, and there's about 4 million cases, about 290,000 deaths in 216 countries that are affected. And if you can see the, the image on the right side of the slide, the kind of sun or corona shaped virus uh, with the electron micrograph with the arrow pointing to the larger structure and the red dots in the larger structure is, the, is a, a zoomed out version of, of the photo. So the, um, the red dot is the coronavirus on human cells. And so these are of course really small uh, microorganisms. <clears throat> So a little bit more about coronavirus. So if you look at the far right side of the slide, the top, you'll see a, a, a small circle that has a bat and a rodent in it. And uh, so coronavirus um, is, uh, um, the natural host for coronavirus are thought to be bats and rodents. And there's a lot of uh, high virus diversity in these animals. And so the, um, typically uh, corona is transmitted to an intermediate host and a couple of examples I have highlighted here. Um, the very top example for the intermediate host is a, a civet cat that was thought to be the, um, the intermediate host for the SARS, um, uh, the SARS epidemic of 2003. So the very first SARS epidemic that we kind of learned about. And just underneath that, the question mark uh, on the right side for the intermediate host, the, um, that's the intermediate host for the current um, pandemic, meaning we don't know what it was um, for SARS-CoV. Um, and then there's a few other examples of MERS came from camels and another uh, beta coronavirus uh, that came from cattle that was transmitted to humans. So this is kind of the mechanism that, you know, these viruses move or spill over from animals to humans. 
And the, all the other circles kind of around the slide are examples of other coronaviruses that affect or um, you know, are, are present in some of these other animals. So you can see we have alpha and beta coronaviruses on the lower left in, in pigs and you know, alpha coronaviruses in companion animals and rabbits. And so the, you know, these viruses are, 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 are present um, in the environment and in, other, and in animals that we interact with. So how are they transmitted? So there's three modes of transmission. Um, the uh, direct contact, indirect contact, and airborne transmission. So direct contact is where you touch somebody or an, an organism, a source, a virus, and then you touch yourself. Or indirect contact where you come in contact with a surface, a uh, contaminated surface that has virus on it, and you touch yourself or infect yourself, or you inhale particles um, that are contain infectious uh, uh, organism. And so you can see over here on the left, you know, kind of the large droplets and small infect infectious droplets will settle out of calm air, um, you know, uh, within a certain distance, you know, so beyond, quote, the six, the magical six feet number, you know, you, you lose a lot of those uh, droplet um, uh, uh, particles, whereas the smaller ones, the more infectious nu nuclei, uh, they can be transmitted further. And, uh, so, and that, of course, varies based on humidity and temperature. <clears throat> and, of course, the size of the particle dictates where they impact or um, in your respiratory tract. All right, so here's an example of uh, the distribution of swine production in the U.S. You can see, you know, Iowa is the number one uh, swine producing state in the U.S. And if you did an overlay of egg production, uh, you would see the same, a very similar pattern. So Iowa is also the number one egg producing state in the nation. And, you know, thinking about influenza and, you know, perhaps um, other viruses, you can see where you have like lots of people and lots of potential um, uh, host for the virus, you could see how, um, you know, um, viruses could uh, mix and interchange um, uh, readily between people and animals. <laughs> and so kind of what we're interested in is doing a little work related to this zoonotic transmission or spillover of influenza. And so we, um, uh, looking at the data, we're like, well, what sort of work do people do? You know, uh, so veterinarians will go in and collect oral fluid samples. You know, they'll touch contaminated surfaces. They'll obviously breathe the air. And then there's been some evidence that we find influenza and there's evidence of other viruses too that emerge from uh, animal production and are detectable in the, in the air around the buildings and inside the building. And so we had some questions about personal exposure um, through inhalation uh, while doing work in these environments. <clears throat> And uh, so a little bit of re uh, information about the work that we do. So we do laboratory and field-based um, uh, research. So the laboratory base, we generate bioaerosol in the lab. We compare samplers and sampler types and medias and pollution control equipment, see how it performs in the lab and, and uh, can collect or control bioaerosols. Uh, some other work we do, we do field-based stuff. So we sample um, swine and poultry production and characterize what's in those samples. We do very specific, uh, look for specific organisms or we do broad characterization. And then also too, we evaluate um, air uh, or treatment technology uh, in production. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example of a study that we did where we were looking at personal uh, exposure to, um, to influenza. And, and basically we, uh, when swine veterinarians went out to farms that where influenza was suspected, they collected oral fluid samples, we hung these personal samplers on them, and we collected air while they were in the building. <clears throat> we analyzed these samples, and uh, th this result is kind of a characterization of the types of, of uh, uh, you know, organisms that we found on the farm. For example, in the second column, that's the type of influenza A we identified. Uh, the third column from the left is the RNA copies per mil in the oral fluid sample. And then as you move to the right, we have number of positives that were identified versus the number of tested, approximate number of animals in the building, the type of farm, the month, outdoor temperature, whether the curtains of ventilation was, was open or closed. Uh, then this next slide, uh, if you look at the second column, so the first row, second column, zero days. This was the time 
elapsed after the initial evaluation. So we collected this sample on the same day that the uh, pigs were, were evaluated for influenza. And uh, as you can see, um, as um, uh, on the other farms, it was a little further out, uh, two days, seven days, 14 days. And as you move to the right on this uh, table, the second to the last column, that, that's kind of a summary of a particular sampler that we used. And you can see we found uh, like on day one, on, on farm one for zero days, the first day we, we uh, the pigs were evaluated for suspected influenza, we found you know, 6,309 RNA copies of influenza per cubic meter of air. So, so we found uh, concentrations of virus and as kind of, um, uh, you know, the time elapsed, got a little further out. So two days, seven days, 14 days, we found less, uh, less virus. Um, so we were finding it in the breathing zone of, of veterinarians. <clears throat> So another uh, work that we did was, um, you know, we would collect samples of, of inhalable dust, a certain size fraction of dust that represents what people breathe, and we characterized what was in that dust. So basically everything, we would amplify the DNA, everything that amplified in the DNA, we would try and identify. And, um, and you know, of course, organisms aren't the only exposure. There's other exposures in these work environments. Dr. Anthony will talk about those, uh, dust, gases, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so here, as I mentioned, the DNA we analyzed in these samples. So um, the bottom three categories, archaea, viruses, and bacteria are from microorganisms. You know, so the majority of the DNA was from microorganisms. There were some uh, eukaryotic DNA, so from animals or humans that was also, were also in the sample, and it was a much lower proportion. And this is among poultry dust. Sorry, I didn't mention that. Um, okay, also on poultry dust, what we did was we ranked the most 25 most abundant uh, microbes in the poultry dust. And uh, based on the red color, you can see kind of the highest concentration. And this, is, again, is relative abundance. So it's not, you know, we don't get a really specific concentration unit. It just kind of ranks them for us. And, you know, so Salinococcus, Lactobacillus, um, and Staphylococcus really kind of emerged as being among the most common organisms we found in this inhalable dust sample. Again, this was an area sample, uh, wasn't on a person. Um, <clears throat> and those are, you know, pretty common uh, bacteria that, that you would find. You know, Lactobacillus is a probiotic um, and Staphylococcus is on, on skin. Here's a few other more specific ones that we identified down the species level, Staphylococcus lentus, Lactobacillus, and enterococcus. <clears throat> we also found um, in the top 25, which is really interesting, we found quite a bit of phage virus. And, and that's, that virus is, um, infects uh, microorganisms or bacteria. And so we found that, and, uh, which was kind of, kind of interesting. <clears throat> also, we found um, when we looked at farrowing uh, in swine production, we did a similar approach where we collected area samples of inhalable dust we characterize the organisms in there. And, you know, in this particular type of, of, of environment, you know, there's moms and baby pigs. And the most common was the lactobacillus um, organism. Again, kind of emerged as, you know, being the most abundant of, of organisms. But we also found some potential opportunistic human pathogens and, um, and some uh, pig pathogens as well. Um, in the in these samples so kind of giving us an indication that you know disease can be transmitted through dust potentially um, uh, between animals and also potentially um, to humans as well <clears throat> okay so kind of some conclusions of this work uh, microorganism transmission between animals and humans it's been happening for a really long time um, and so, of course, uh, we're, you know, we're concerned about this. We want to limit this uh, in areas that we have a lot of host um, organisms or host, host animals. Um, exposure to these organisms happens during uh, routine animal care and, hu and husbandry. And, of course, we want to try and limit, um, limit uh, transmission so that, uh, you know, we don't have the emergence of new zoonotic disease uh, in humans. And, you know, you can limit exposure exposure by following animal care guidelines, biosecurity guidelines, basic uh, personal protection or implementing uh, 
you know, engineering controls like a ventilation system and, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit of acknowledgement. So the Great Plains Center for Agricultural Health uh, funded some of this work. It's one of the 10 NIOSH AFF centers. And uh, also to the Southwest Center for Agricultural Health Injury Prevention and Education in Texas also funded some of this work. Uh, so I wanna make sure I acknowledge them. <clears throat> 